we're going to talk today uh, about um, uh, basically empowering uh, individuals uh, by uh, how to uh, affect graphics, tablets, or tables, and white space within a uh, proposal document. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people in the room? I know we've got an overflow uh, crowd today, but how many in the room? Uh, touch a proposal in any way, shape, or form, either by editing, writing, reviewing, reading. So we got some interested parties here. Okay. Uh, my goal here is to inspire you to uh, don't be afraid to add graphics and, and figures and to augment your proposal, and we'll cover that in a little more detail as we move forward. My name is Michael Northrup. I work at Research Development. And uh, this is uh, a presentation designed basically to share a little of my, uh, of my knowledge with you. So why do we do this? Uh, specifically, why do we submit a proposal? Uh, I'm sure some of us out there like to do it for our health. And there's probably some of us that like to do it because there's probably nothing better to do. Uh, but I would imagine we want to win. Uh, this is, these are high dollar stakes. Uh, you basically are competing with other entities, other universities for uh, high dollar amounts that uh, figure into the millions. Um, that being said, when I, my role in proposal design typically has been I create everything from cover art to uh, scientific figures uh, and occasionally I get the opportunity to do page layout. And we're going to cover all those things uh, from a designer's perspective about how to make your proposal uh, more aesthetically appealing to your reviewer. Um, when I work on a proposal, I, uh, I, when I was made aware of the amount of money that uh, these things uh, play into, I, uh, I got thinking, well, what would this proposal look like? What would proposal design look like if it were a dramatic television series? So here's what that might look like. Good morning, Mr. Phelps. This is Dr. Noah Chance, codenamed the Dream Killer. He is the primary influencer for the highly strategic and valuable National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center, or STC program. The STC program is of vital importance to our organization. So far, we have not been able to break through it in the world. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to develop a dynamic proposal that will persuade the Dream Killer to expose a lucrative seven-figure funding stream securing our research for years to come. We suggest that you include powerful graphics to get your ideas across. As usual, should you or any member of your proposal team remain unfunded, the Director of Research Development will disavow any knowledge of your existence. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck to you. So after that little bit of drama, I uh, will submit to you that we are all Jim Phelps. <laughs> Wait, moving on. <laughs> uh, here's the real intro. Okay, we're designing for uh, proposals covering graphics, uh, cover art, page layout, and it will touch on images as well. Some of the do's and don'ts as we move forward. A uh, little bit of shop talk. 
uh, before we get started. Uh, just some, some uh, a little bit of information here that basically drives my design uh, when I do these things. The last thing I want to draw your attention to here on this slide is that last line. Although these reactions are subliminal, they do cause the viewer to categorize unconsciously the value of a proposal or presentation, which means you can't leave anything anything to risk on something like this. So you need to take advantage. Uh, just a quick note, uh, your, P, your PI, your faculty member, whoever you're working for in, in your role as you play, that you play in your uh, proposal design, you have to assume the, the uh, role of coach. You have to be the expert. You're the go-to. You're the go-to guy. The more thinking you do on your end, the less they've got to do on their end. The last thing I think we 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 want is to have your actual PI or faculty member become unhinged because the graphics aren't where they're supposed to be. Uh, I think if you go into something like this looking like a pro, you're going to get pro results. So. Our first metaphor of the uh, of the afternoon of the morning. Okay, this let's say this beautiful bottle of water here is your proposal. It's it's finished. Uh, it's clean. It's polished. Your edges are all nice and clean. All your formatting's right. It's pure, and it's full of relevant content. And you just you put everything you can into this beautiful highly polished product. It's well formatted. But it is another thing that um, I'm going to remind us about. It Basically, you are selling a product. Uh, a proposal is basically a selling tool. You have got to be persuasive in your argument. Because guess what? You've got competitors out there. Those competitors are playing for the same money you're playing for. And guess what? You don't know who they are, but you have to assume one thing. They're coming to play. And they could just as easily look like this. Now, looking at this, we don't have a chance. Our proposal was beautiful. But if we want to compete and play in this game, we have got to have an identity. That identity that we're talking about comes in the form of cover art, graphics, page layout, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, the imagery that you use. So that being said, uh, I will put this up again and let you know that you know well-executed design leaves a favorable and memorable impression throughout the review of a proposal. The opposite can be true also. Poorly executed design will leave the same impression. So why not? Go for broke. Why not put throw everything you can at your presentation and try to make it look as professional as possible? You know, take advantage. Uh, one more little bit of shop talk. And this, I think, I might be preaching to the choir here. I think uh, many of us know this. Um, you know, this idea of um, six, the sixty thousand times number, where. Uh, Basically, that uh, graphics uh, images are re are processed that much that much faster than text alone, and can be recollected 38% more accurately than text. So why not augment your text with graphics? Um, here, uh, as we start to move into our uh, uh, basically our meat of the presentation, I just want to remind you of. Some principles of design, uh, balance, rhythm, proportion, dominance, unity, and repetition of form. Um, and you'll see as we move forward how these play, how these play out. Uh, they're all very important. Uh, here is a, uh, a good example of a uh, figure, a scientific uh, graphic that I did, that covers all of these things. Uh, we definitely see the balance, we see the rhythm. There's proportion there, there's dominance there, there's unity, there's repetition of form. <clears throat> now, I will be honest with you, anybody can justify any of these things in any graphic. There's something you'll be able to point out. Oh, well, mine has balance. We can see whatever it is you're, you want to, if you want to argue 
for any one of the figures, that's great. But you know what? There's one thing missing here that does make a difference, that does define a really good, effective, persuasive graphic from an, an ordinary or, or a subordinary one, and that is the aesthetic value. Does it have resonance? Does it have persuasion? Is this something that your reviewer will remember? That's the key here, is making your reviewer remember what they saw. Um, so we're now we're going to talk about low-hanging fruit. The, the, these things, uh, I would consider them to be lists, timelines, Gantt charts, org charts, uh, callouts, and simple graphs. These are things that you as a, whatever, lay, whatever level you play in uh, proposal design can do with simply uh, PowerPoint uh, and Shutterstock, which is my go-to uh, image source. Now, depending on who you work for, you, you most likely have access to, to Shutterstock. The, the uh, department you work for probably has an account. So don't be afraid to shop there and, and take your images there. We'll cover this in a little more detail as we go on. But let's first now talk about our first, uh, our first uh, graphic here. This is a very simple uh, table. <clears throat> these, th these things are uh, very, very uh, uh, influential. They are simple, and every proposal has them. And there's nothing wrong with this. It tells a story. Uh, it tells you what you want to know. But what if we just, with a little bit of, uh, of creative effort, created something that was just a, a little more dynamic? Uh, once again, you know, a graphic like this, which is, it's now a graphic, we now can see that we've got balance, we have rhythm, we have proportion, we have dominance, unity, and most of all, we have repetition of form, which is something you can build throughout your document to give your document unity um, and a cohesiveness that I personally believe your reviewer will remember. Um, uh, once again, this, this can be done in Word. Uh, and I, I might be again preaching to the choir because we do we use Word all the time. It's sort of the go-to tool, but the combination of Word and PowerPoint is just unstoppable. So. Um, once again, uh, we've created aesthetic value here. Now, let's look at this table. Okay, we could give this table the same treatment. We could, uh, this is a good example where we could basically follow our repetition of form, but I want to take this in a different direction. Uh, once again, adding some more aesthetic value, not only to the table design, but also your page design. So instead of just a standard horizontal, and once again, this only really applies if you, you'll know whether you can do it or not. This is a very simple table. Uh, it won't really work like the other one will, which is a lot more complicated with a lot more, a lot more rows. But do it vertically. We have the same information, um, but now we've created a more dynamic page that, um, once again, if you do this, do it this way, and you build your table vertically this way with very, uh, very limited color range, very limited color palette, you once again are setting the stage for a repetition of form formula that you can play out throughout your document. Um, once again, we've created aesthetic value. Simple, a very simple uh, org chart here. Uh, nothing wrong with this. It's very clean. It's very elegant. And it has its own um, repetition of form elements there. It has its own aesthetic value. But one thing we can do to make this just a little bit more memorable is we can uh, we can polish it up with some design elements. Once again, we've added some things here that you'll see in the next couple of slides where we're, we're able to duplicate this repetition of form, creating, once again, building continuity in your document. Um, proposals are full of bulleted lists. Everybody uses them. Everybody has seen them. But just a little bit of effort you can add a little bit of flair to your particular bulleted list, adding some dynamics to it. Ah, yes, the old familiar org chart. Nothing wrong with this org chart. Fairly simple, uh, just a couple of layers deep, but forgettable. Everybody else 
submitting a proposal has this in there of one form or another. So based on our, our current uh, track of thinking, why don't we just buff it up a little bit? Now, this is what I like to call out of the box thinking. We don't have our uh, text elements inside a box anymore. Now they're next to the box. Uh, now what we've created is a really nice graphic look that once again sets your proposal apart from the competition. It leaves your reviewer with something else to remember. And if you feel like it and you need color coding, add color coding. Now, of course, you don't want to do this unless you're at a legend down here of some kind, but it is a great way to, uh, to add continuity as you move through your document. Yeah. Oh, online, okay. So back in the 1970s, people in management sciences were completely into systems theory, and so they created some rules for how to create, a, you know, structural rules for creating org charts. It had to do with support functions and, and direct reporting functions. Some of that has still existed, but I'm curious if that has extended into your work as sort of, you know, correct ways to organize an org chart that are, um, that are organized in a meaningful and technically documented way as opposed to putting names on a page in a way that graphically looks good. Because some people think that that means something and other people think that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Or maybe maybe it's more appropriate to say they just simply wouldn't know what it is that they're looking at. But if done correctly, either you notice or you don't. If done incorrectly, people may notice who are, who are doing reviews and, and how do we address that? Yeah, interesting question. Um, uh, my level of knowledge and expertise doesn't go that far back. So I don't really have any good or bad habits to. Well, those papers were recopied into the 80s and 90s, so they're still around. They're still around. <laughs> um, here's, uh, here's where my uh, where my expertise with this begins and ends. Typically, if I can go back here, this is what I'm provided with by the PI or the faculty member. And so I take this as gospel. I say this is the way they want this represented. I don't know of any pre-existing track record, I have to make the assumption that this is basically their story they want to tell. And I just make the assumption that, like you're saying, you know, all the all those guidelines are, are in place here. But you know what, it's another interesting, you bring up an interesting question because sometimes I will uh, get some org charts where they've got some very unusual line bends and directionals that, um, you know, like for example, uh, a really subtle one here is the disconnection here, this is on purpose. This is this was meant to be. That this was a, a sticking point. However, it was only a sticking point at this with this design. <clears throat> now, what I mean by that is, for whatever reason, that meant something to somebody. <clears throat> but when I redid it, I mis I just mistakenly made the connection. I I I kind of disregarded it and thought that was a mistake. They called me on it and said, "No, we have to have that line back." But it started a conversation between the PI, the faculty, and that team that eventually they realized, well, no, it does need to be connected. So sometimes these things start out as, uh, if nothing else, they, they start as conversation pieces and, and cause a dialogue between all the, all the players. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But, <laughs> but I know what you're saying. If, 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 we, get a di if we get a diagram an org chart that comes across our, our, our desk and it follows kind of like what you're saying where there's a lot of little nuances in there that possibly do speak to a certain kind of uh, dynamic or criteria. Um, we're oftentimes just told to leave it alone and, and just move around it and use it as is. Right, right. Okay, so once again, I just want to reiterate, you'll see this a lot through the presentation. I'm all about well-executed design. You want to leave a memorable impression on your reviewer anywhere you can. Now, I just, I threw this one in here too. This is an org chart that uh, came my way. Uh, this was the way that it was submitted and uh, I 
have already created several other graphics along the way when I needed to create something where I could basically add some kind of repetition of form that was already being presented throughout the document. One of the things that intrigued me about this one was the lack of vertical lines. And the discussion was, well, this is very linear. It works its way top down. So it's very easy to see global markets leads to companies, companies lead uh, to the uh, five uh, subgroups and down into the review area, then the educational institutions, and then down into the final four columns. Uh, so there's a lot implied here. And uh, I was very impressed with the people that sent this to me. But I needed to add some flair to it, so I just put a couple of black boxes on there. Now I have simple repetition that, that can follow the document through. Uh, here is a simple list. This could appear as a bulleted list. This uh, could appear in a table. And it is actually it's a table here. But I just wanted to touch on, we've got this uh, set a piece graphic here as a, basically an, an identifier that um, causes the reviewer to think, well, okay, we are, we are talking about you know, money. This was done in PowerPoint. Um, if there's anybody in the room or online that does not know how to put an image into a, a circle, I can show you how to do that. It's quick, easy steps. Uh, very, it's a very functional way to do to do graphics. And um, actually, I'm working on a very, very uh, small, simple tutorial that I can send you once it's done, which will be done probably within a week. That just focuses on that aspect of it. But once again, all this is done in in PowerPoint, saved out as a JPEG file and imported. Never cut and paste. Always import. You have to import a graphic in order to maintain its sharpness. You start cutting and pasting. Uh, you end up with what are called um, artifacts, and they can get they can get fuzzy very quickly, and and, and they don't scale well. Uh, once again, we're moving with a very simple Gantt chart. The relationship between this graphic and the last one is the repetition of form. Uh, here lies within the color. Yes, and color is a is part of the repetition of form formula. Uh, once again, this was done in PowerPoint. Uh, every, in fact, everything you see uh, it, moving forward, uh, all of us had done PowerPoint. The only thing that was was the cancer diagram. Sorry. Uh, a very simple timeline. This isn't going to work every time, but uh, if you have a very simple timeline with, with very few years, uh, try something like this. Now, the other thing I want to reiterate here is this is this PowerPoint presentation is available to anyone in the room or online to either use as a template, inspiration, uh, ideas, whatever it is you know that you're that you're looking for. If you do need to have some kind of inspiration, by all means, use this as a source. Okay, let's talk about simple figures and diagrams. Uh, I call this particular slide something out of nothing. If you're going through a, a, a proposal and you come across a paragraph or a sentence and you need something in that page to break it up, go with a very simple icon. Uh, I picked three here. One is a process uh, icon, one is a science, and one is an environment icon, um, all available for Shutterstock. So, uh, you know, if you don't like the, the uh, microscope, for science, use a, use a magnifying glass. You know, if you don't like the magnifying glass, use the molecule. There are lots of different ways you can do, you can work with these. I wanted to just reiterate here that these, I've listed these as zones. Don't clutter your graphic or your diagram with a lot of text here. I've just got zone two here. But if you've got three or four words here that move along, very short, let your caption do the talking here. This is a great way to break up a page and add a, a little of interest to maybe a page that's otherwise just full of nothing but, but text. It's going to draw your reviewer uh, uh, right to this figure. And once again, if, if done properly, will leave a memorable impression. Um, just another shout out to Shutterstock. It's a, I found it, these images by searching for icons, uh, JPEGs, and uh, all kinds of different, different, uh, different options show up. All right, now, 
we are going to move into some advanced figure design. Uh, once again, using PowerPoint and Shutterstock as the main tools. Before we move much, much further, though, I want to show you this nifty little uh, chart that uh, a couple of my colleagues uh, created for me uh, to point out a couple of uh, strategic things. First of all, we move from strict to loose. We move from conservative to innovative, and right down here in that bottom box is NIH. NIH uh, has some very strict rules. Anybody that's ever worked on one knows that uh, the guidelines uh, are uh, are very very uh, specialized and limited. For that matter, for that being said, uh, if you're a figure that looks that is in an NIH proposal, it might look something like this: black and white, uh, not a lot of flare, just enough information there to uh, uh, to tell the story. Uh, NSF. Moving a little further up the up the chain, we're less strict, we're less conservative, but we're still in that quadrant. So uh, your graphics are going to tend to be still uh, informational based, very simple, uh, little or no color. And as we move further up the line, say for example a NASA graphic, uh, a little more fluid, a little a little more abstract uh, in this design, introducing color, dimension. Um, and we're we're breaking we're at a breaking point right here in the middle where we're getting to the point where about anything goes uh, with, with a proposal from NASA. And then we've got USAID, uh, even a, a little more elaborate as far, or at least as elaborate. Here, this was actually a cover that we did for uh, the USAID, and we actually ended up killing two birds with one stone and introducing not only cover art but also a uh, a figure that defined uh, what the global research commons uh, was. And finally, we have private industry, which can be uh, pretty much over the top, uh, heavy, very heavy abstract graphics. Uh, here we have a very simple graphic where we have three components. We've overlaid them on top of a map, which is overlaid on top of a graphic, which is overlaid on top of an image. Actually, this is part of a much larger page, but this is basically the uh, the gist of, of, uh, of what it looked like. And once again, I've got to tell you, it's all about well executed design, leaving a favorable and memorable impression. I'm just going to harp on that. It's so critical. Uh, in fact, it's so critical, I'm going to say it again. Uh, just if you follow this rule and keep this in mind, you'll have a highly competitive proposal at your time of submission. So now we'll talk about one of my favorite design elements the circle. You've seen it in a lot of the other things I've done. You're going to see it uh, now in some other examples. Here we have nothing but a huge list. We needed to get an identifier uh, to give some cohesiveness and some impact to this graphic and a focal point. So uh, we looked around, and after a lot of discussion, uh, we decided that we would put something like this in. Uh, a very abstract graphic. All it's really meant to do is show connectivity, but it's powerful enough and strong enough that uh, our, our goal was to at least get our reviewers to look at at least a few of these topics and get basically get the idea that uh, the you know that ASU is a such a dynamic university that all these things uh, play a role. They're all interconnected. Once again, another list. This could be a simple bulleted list that your reviewer would look right by. But if you've got the space and you're able to dedicate about eight inches uh, horizontally and maybe about three and a half inches vertically, something like this could very easily be done uh, in PowerPoint, which this one was. Once again, we're dropping images into uh, circle shapes. The difference here is, you know, they're, they're old. They're slightly elongated. We did that a couple of these just to give create some tension in the graphic and make it just a little bit more fun to look at. Um, once again, Shutterstock and PowerPoint. So, real world. This was given to me to put in a proposal. This was given to me by a highly prominent, well-respected PI faculty member. And it resonated with her. This 
basically told her story. I had to be very cognizant of that one during the redesign, but I also knew this could not go into the presentation. There's you know, the proposal, there's just no way. In fact, um, putting something like this in is equivalent to putting this in. It just is a chocolate mess. It, it, it's just, it's, it's not proposal ready. So, let's revisit. What do we do with something like this? What do we do differently to tell this story? Well, after uh, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of consternation, and uh, a little bit of forced, uh, forethought, and a couple of uh, trial, trial and error to get this right, uh, this is what we came up with. So once again, we are telling the exact same story, but in a far simpler way. We still have the linear design. We still are moving you know, from left to right. We're still moving back and forth. We have all those little nuances that the original graphic had, but now we have something that uh, we believe will leave a, 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 um, a memorable response to with our, with our reviewer. Another, another real world example really quick. Once again, highly respected PI, high, uh, very prominent uh, faculty member. Um, this came across my desk. There's no way this was going to go into a proposal. So, I analyzed it after a couple of conversations with the PI. I looked at this and I thought, well, okay, what's, what's the deal here? Why do we have humans here and humans here? And where's the star of the show? Uh, it looks like we've got a river or a lake, a little happy fish. Uh, none of this stuff is going to resonate with the reviewer. Uh, guarantee it. So after a little, uh, a little, uh, uh, Playtime, basically, and a little bit of work, uh, we came up with this. Now, we have a star of the show, a clear star of the show. Uh, we have humans, oops, sorry, ahead of myself. We have humans <laughs> playing a role in one spot, and we can see they're down, they're, they're basically downstream. Anyway, a lot going on here as far as this circle about how water works, but by far, uh, a much better way to go. And now we get to this one. Okay, another example. Uh, once again, uh, uh, high performing PI. What do we do uh, with all this information? Well, we want to leave it exactly where it is. What's important to him needs to stay important. All these elements need to play uh, an existing role. Well, here they are, again, the same way. Now, once again, I want to, I want to reiter reiterate again. If you guys design graphics, or if you rely on somebody to design them for you, and maybe they're not up to uh, the design level uh, that maybe I am, or, or some of uh, uh, another graphic designer, showing this kind of thing to them and saying, I need something like this, and using something like this as a, as a template goes a long way. And once you've seen this, it's very easy to design to it. Whatever your message is, uh, take, it, take, uh, take the aesthetics out of something like this and move it in, into your own graphics. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about cover art. Um, an NIH document isn't going to require cover art. A lot of them don't. But as you move away that, that graph that we showed earlier, uh, some proposals do. Get to have cover art. So why not make it as dynamic and as uh, persuasive as you possibly can? Once again, as I will mention, you know that um, it's all about leaving that favorable and memorable impression. And that cover, especially, because this cover sets the stage for what is to come. And it, it, I believe that it's almost a conditioning factor. Once your reviewer sees this, everything they see that comes on behind it, they're going to they're going to relate back to this graphic somehow, uh, subliminal, subliminal, or otherwise. So how do we get to that cover? Well, we go to Shutterstock and we type in uh, in the search. We type in something like engineering abstract or uh, chemical abstract. That's why we have all these. These images are not concrete. They're all very abstract-looking looking graphics. And 
For the example, you know, we're going to use this one. So I pick this one very easily. Once again, if you're really good with Word, you can do this in Word. Uh, I don't have that kind of control with Word. So PowerPoint is my tool of choice or something like this. You save it out as a JPEG file, pop it into your first page on your, on your Word document. Very easy to do, very effective. And the idea here is to turn your reviewer's head. You might get pushed back from other faculty members, oh, that's not what I want, that's not what I see, that's not what my research is about. This is a balancing act that I think everyone who works on proposals, they have to play. The idea here is to, is to win the award. It's, it's not to create a piece of art that they can put in their living room behind their sofa. Uh, if that's what we get, fine, but if they go, that's not the goal. Let's talk a little bit about typography here as we come to, uh, come to a close. Um, typographers love to design type, and they have all kinds of definitions for everything that has to do with a certain, uh, a certain type. Uh, this happens to be times we talk about, you know, the, the serif, the power of the serif. Uh, we have another case over here where we talk about this stem, uh, the descender, the ascender, all these things. Pe people that design type very serious about it, and so they uh, just know a lot of research and science has gone into all the different types that you use. And just a very quick note. Um, for those of you uh, interested, this is times, that's the typeface. Times bold, times italic, times bold italic are the fonts. But it's kind of like going into a, car, a tire shop and asking for a new set of wheels. The guy selling the tires knows what you want. You don't have to say, oh, I need a new set of tires. He knows. Some people don't know the difference between a tire and a wheel. We as drivers of cars don't really need to know that. The guy on the other side with the lug wrench does know and he does need to know. So anyway, just a little shop talk about type. We move on. I want to talk a little bit about um, typography as it concerns a page. Now, uh, this is going to get a little sticky here uh, because I know that when there is a certain page count, you have this tendency to want to cram as much text as you can into a page because somehow it's all relevant and leaving one little line of text out could make or break it. I, I, I think you, I, I think that's overthinking it. Power here is in editing. Unless you're writing a novel, <laughs> then, uh, you know, this type of type, it, it works well. Um, but I want to show one quick little thing here. We're talking about letting here. Letting is the distance between one line to the next. Not this one's again shop talk. You don't really even know that term, but that's what it's called. Um, I believe this is there's, there's there's nothing wrong with a page like this. I know a lot of pages in a proposal are nothing but text. But what if we could just let that text breathe a little bit? Just give it a little bit of space between lines. Now we've went, we've increased the letting. Uh, much easier for a reviewer to read through this. And this is going to leave a lasting impression, especially with the other ones that you're competing against who chose not to do this. I believe it will. Yes, you're sacrificing a little bit of text. How much text? Not much. Probably maybe 10 to 20 words. At the most. Uh, I think you can make up for that in very strong editing, but I do believe this aesthetic approach to uh, typography uh, is a way to make your work stand out and stand above your, your competitors. Uh, there's a very intricate formula that I like to refer to uh, when doing this. It's quality over quantity, nothing more than that. Here, we now have, instead of a indent, tab indent, we now have a space to divide our paragraphs. This is, this is important. Uh, once again, we are sacrificing content to do this. But what we've introduced here uh, is, is a relatively new term that we call chunking. It basically allows the reader to break the text up 
subliminally or otherwise into shorter, uh, more manageable chunks. Now, why is this more critical now than it, than it has been in the past? Um, this is just not my theory. This is actual fact that's documented. This thing. Every one of us in this room and online are glued to this device. And as such, we've learned to read to process the information that it has in a much different way. We glance, we skim, and we chunk. Your reviewer does the same thing. They might not know it, but why not accommodate that, that little quirk in your in your uh, content. Uh, I think this is um, the idea of chunking basically is, is a very powerful tool in the creation of a proposal. Okay, now we're talking about a call out. Um, basically, uh, we want to break this page up a little bit and we want to uh, draw the reviewer's attention. So we create a little call out here. We pop in a, just a little bit of text that it's gives the, uh, the page a focal point. The reviewer is going to look at this, especially if you've scattered this kind of thing throughout your document. Uh, it becomes a lot of different things. It also becomes repetition of form. Uh, it, it, it adds a, a, a layer of, of aesthetic value. And if you did, um, if you followed some of the other principles we talked about earlier on, you did a work chart or out of the box and you did a bullet list, you can throw in a little graphic right there and now you've added more repetition of form. One, once again, adding to the continuity of your of your document. Um, pet peeve: rivers or hyphens. Don't really notice it here, but we've got text that's left, right, justified. This is a very elegant way to to present text. Um, some will argue that uh, it's a little hard to follow from line to line uh, reading this method. Graphically, it's beautiful. And I'm not really going to argue the point whether or not you should say left, right, justified, or rapid, right. <clears throat> However, sometimes there's a need to create a sidebar. And when we create that sidebar and we still use that left, right justification, we create these huge gaps between words and they're called rivers. Sometimes the idea being you can just like get a flow going down through these words. Uh, a lot of people just take this for granted and say, well, that's just how it is. I'm not going to make my, I'm not going to make my uh, sidebar rag right, right. It has to be this way. And these things just become acceptable. You know, you, you look at it a closer look, it's just, to me, it, it's very, it, it's very poor graphics. Yeah? It's, it's very unclean and kind of sloppy in my opinion. So how do we fix this? Very simply, we add a hyphen. Um, simply by adding uh, a hyphen, we've, uh, we've run miracle. Same content, we've buttoned up all those spaces. Um, much cleaner, looks much better on your page. Now, as we get closer here, I want to talk a little about graphics and white space very quickly. So, uh, just to keep things going here, here we have a very informative infographic. The, uh, the rules of design here were that I was given full page width, eight inches this way, by about a third of the, of the height of the, of the page. And so when we initiated it into the uh, proposal, it looked really good. It's all very readable. It's still, it's got an aesthetic look to it. It's, it's uh, and there's an impact to it. But sometimes this graphic and many of my graphics, probably many of yours, if you do them, you eventually, they get out there in the world and you lose control and you get this. And this is just devastating. There's no reason for that graphic to even be there. It's not readable. Uh, and one of the other things, when you do start scaling, even when you start scaling down, you end up with a fuzzy graphic. And a fuzzy graphic is just as memorable and is just as effective for creating a brand or identity for your group or your university as a nice, well-played graphic. So it's always something to be cognizant of. How is your, how is your reviewer going to see this aesthetically? And once again, 
It's all about you want to leave a favorable impression. At every turn, every possible turn, every advantage that you can have, you take, you should. One of the things that we do, that we are starting to do, uh, in order to preserve the, uh, the space for a graphic like this is early on, we send the PI or faculty member this. We don't know what the graphic is going to be. We have basically carved out a spot where we swear we want it so that everybody knows and is reminded, well, we told you you wanted something this, this, this wide and this length. And so we're reminding them back, yeah, you told us that's the size. So we're going to keep it there. It doesn't always have to be. It's just one example. If it's a much smaller area, and we know that going in, we'll design for such. But there's a big difference between a graphic that takes up uh, a half page and one that takes up a sixteenth of a page. You have to design accordingly. So we're going to finish up here talking a little bit about images and some do's and don'ts and some things you may or, or may not know. Um, Always, always, always place for import. The little icon in, uh, in Word to do. Don't ever cut and paste. Talked about that a little bit before. You leave artifacts, you leave remnants. Uh, they're just never sharp. Um, JPEG file is the go to source uh, that you can once again find in Shutterstock. And as, a very, uh, as an example here, I just want to show you this. Here we're going to look at this young lady's eye. And we have zoomed in on it, and it's nice and tack sharp. Now, what I would like to point out here is that if you have Acrobat Reader or Adobe Acrobat Pro, open your graphic in Acrobat and use the zoom key and zoom in on that graphic. If you're at all unsure about the sharpness or quality, if you get a nice, beautiful, sharp, this is like 500%. So if we know we have sharpness here, we know we're going to have sharpness here. Just the slightest little touch for maybe grabbing a low res image now is multiplied severely. And you may not use an image this blown up in your, in your proposal. But I'm just really trying to drive home the point that always try to use the sharpest images you can find. I'll talk a little bit about that now. So when you do a Google search, you want to look, obviously, for the high number. This is a very high, uh, high resolution graphic. It would be perfect for a, uh, a proposal. Uh, you can see, uh, for, for uh, something I should say, half page, full page width. But when you find a smaller one, a very tiny number, be cognizant of that tiny number. This isn't something you're going to be able to use very much larger than the way that it came in. So don't try to scale it because it will get fuzzy. You just don't want fuzzy graphics. Let me talk a little bit here about what kind of images you can and cannot take from Google. Um, you select images, you select labeled, and from labeled, you get labeled for use. We drop it down and we get labeled for reuse. Your um, quantity will, will, will shrink down substantially, but you can feel comfortable about the fact that anything you take from Google using this search, you'll be OK with. Uh, I want to uh, show you this really quick, just so, every, so, so, so that you know where you stand. This is the uh, Copyright Act. Uh, specifically section 107, and it talks about uh, fair use. Now, images basically can be used without compensation to the owner. If it's criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and guess what? Research. But don't, don't jump too quickly at something like this. Uh, you're protected. As long as you, if you're going to insist on using an image, but I will tell you a real world example that happened a couple of weeks ago. A, uh, once again, a very high profile faculty member presented to me a figure that they wanted me to clean up and, and uh, otherwise camouflage 
because she had taken it from a Nature article. So Nature is a very is a very prestigious publication, and that would be bad form. You don't want a graphic that is appeared in a publication to go into your paper. Even if you acknowledge it, I think it's still you're better off getting a different illustration. So even though this does play, yeah, your reviewer you may leave the bad taste in their mouth. So, but I wanted you to be aware. This is what it says. This is what allows you to use images without um, getting permission. Uh, really quick uh, uh, summary here: uh, Shutterstock, great subscription-based purchase. Uh, Sorry, subscription or buy the image. Pixabay is free, Unsplash is free, and then of course Google. Uh, boy, that's your last last one. If you can't find it here, uh, be very careful about using Google Images. It's allowed, but you never know. You've got one audience member that may or may not have seen it before, and it could cast a cloud on your on your proposal. Uh, I want to just finish up here by showing this is a. Uh, a couple of great resources. I recommend Mike Parkinson and his cheat sheet. Uh, this is a downloadable PDF uh, from this website, Billion Dollar Graphics. I recommend printing it on 1117 paper. And you may never use any of these things in your in your uh, figure design. But you know what? It's great for inspiration and, and great for I uh, ideas. Just to have something like this around. And then I would recommend that uh, at your leisure, I would look up Edward Tuft. And any of these four books uh, are outstanding resources to get a better idea of where data visualization came from, uh, why it is what it is, and you know, just basically um, great reference, great reference guide. Yeah, they're a little steep; they're about forty bucks a piece, but man, it's important that it would be great if you have something if your um, if your department or center could have something like this in hand. And finally, if there's one, one little thing I can uh, leave you with, it is Arizona's favorite son, who, since you've got to reach out and grab him by the throat, it applies in rock and roll, and it applies in proposal design. And with that, this presentation is self-destructive. <laughs> Soon after the questions, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to take them. Are you able to see your PowerPoints online afterward, after this? If you're okay with that. Can we sh see your PowerPoint? So oh, we'll absolutely. share them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll send them out afterwards. Yes, I believe we recorded this. Yep. So it will be available for... Now, our, our uh, LJ here is the... You're, you're going to manage that. I don't mm -hmm. know where that's going to end up being. So. Yeah, I've got it. But you can certainly contact me. And I'll make it available to you. But yes, this is this stuff's all available. I I really want everybody to have this, just like I said, just so nothing else, either you know, for reference, you know, it's, or just inspiration. And I do want to give a quick shout out, especially of all of these people over here. Uh, it's Karen Walker who wrote that fantastic Mission Impossible dialogue for me. So, unless you have any other questions, that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yes, sir. Scott, laser pointer. Just a very simple question. Can I have a second look about how to use Typhoon to reduce the gap between the word just uh, several slides before? The yeah. rivers and hyphens, is that the one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused. How to use hyphen to reduce the gap between word and you, word? You should, in Word, you have the option to turn hyphens on or off. So you select your text, and one of your little menu items across the top will, will have that control, either to have, add hyphens or turn them off. Very easy to find. Okay. Just look for it. Now that you know to look for it, you'll find it. Okay. And that'll do it. Thank you. That allows you to keep that justification, that left right justification. Yeah, she pointed that out very conversation. Okay. And it looks like we've got nope, just thanks for the great presentation. Taylor online. Yay. Very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, great.